Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you and also those who are worshiping with us by means of live streaming. We are in God's house to glorify his name. This morning we have the privilege of participating in the Lord's Supper Sacrament. That too is a joy as we reflect on the grace of God in our lives, the grace by which we are saved. In Matthew 11, we read these words, a warm, inviting uh, invitation from our Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, Jesus says. Let's stand and sing praises to the Lord. Our hymn is entitled, God, we sing your glorious praises.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. For you are God's people, saved by grace through faith in Jesus. Amen. Please take a moment to welcome one another. Jesus is our Redeemer. He's purchased our salvation with his blood. Paul makes very clear when he begins the book of Romans that we need that Savior. We need that redemption. We need to be delivered from our sin and from the wrath of God upon it. He writes in the opening chapter of Romans, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their futile thinking, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshiped and served, created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. In response to that declaration of our brokenness, of our estrangement from God and his response to it, of giving human beings over to their sinful ways, we look to Jesus. We sing of his amazing love. He's our savior. He's our king. Let's sing together, you are my king.
Would you please stand? In the Apostles' Creed, we confess our faith, not simply what we believe in our heads, but what's in our heart, our wholehearted commitment to our triune God. Let's say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. One announcement as we join our hearts together in our congregational prayer this morning. Joy Locker apparently had a mild stroke this past week. They're not quite sure when uh, she had it. Her symptoms um, she interpreted as being from her frequent migraines, but by Friday, uh, her vision in her left eye uh, had become a bit fuzzy, so she called her doctor. He sent her to the ER, and uh, Saturday they said they concluded that she had had a mild stroke. Thankfully, um, that's the only effect of it that she currently has is that uh, fuzziness in her eye. Uh, we want to pray that that will go away. She's being monitored with a heart monitor. Uh, we also, of course, pray that there'll be no more uh, difficulties, that the Lord will give healing to her. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Lord, <clears throat> our Lord and our God, we come to you as our, our Savior and the ruler of our lives. We come to you in love. It's our response to the love that you have shown to us. We need your love, Lord, for we recognize that we have uh, every right to be the recipients of your anger instead of your love because of the fact that we so often do not give you and others what we ought to. We do not give you the praise, the glory, the heartfelt worship and love that you, a God of amazing love, you, our Redeemer and King, deserve. Lord, forgive us for our sins. We ask that in the name of Jesus Christ. He is our hope. He's the rock on which we stand. We come before you in his name. And we pray, Lord, that on this morning as we participate in the Lord's Supper, that your spirit may be within us, that your spirit may be motivating us in our worship here this morning, and especially, Lord, as we partake of Holy Communion and remember the death of our Savior and his atonement for us. Lord, we pray that your spirit may lift up our hearts to you in joy and grateful love. We pray, Lord, that you would also bless us as a church, that each day in our lives we may be a holy place, that we may be a place where you are pleased to be present, that we may be those through whom others can see the glory and love of our God. Lord, as we pray to you this morning, we lift up the needs of people in our congregation who are uh, in difficult health or going through troubling times. We place them before you 
You have said, come to me. I will give you rest. We thank you for that promise. We know that you give rest to us within us, in our hearts, in our lives, in our souls. We pray, Lord, that you would give us the peace that comes too, knowing that our lives are in your hands at all times, and that you, O oh Lord, are strong, that you are loving. We pray that you would be with Tom Sturk as he continues undergoing treatment for his cancer. Lord, we pray that the side effects may be minimal, but that the chemo may be strongly effective. We pray that it may overcome the cancer that is within him. And we pray that that cancer may shrink, that it may not grow. We pray, Lord, for Claire Ventil with uh, his cancer and the infusions that he has been receiving. We pray, O oh Lord, that it may be soon clear whether he needs to change the, the type of infusions that he has or may continue. Meanwhile, Lord, give him strength. Give him the air that he needs, the oxygen to fill his lungs, which are compromised because of his cancer. Lord, we pray too for Joy Locker. We pray that she may have no further uh, strokes or difficulties of that sort. We pray that you'd give healing to her eye. We ask, Lord, that you'd be with Helen Thummel, too, and heal her bones and the fractures that she has. We pray for Claire Fobble, James Eilstra. Uh, Lord, we lift them up as two who have needs that aren't going to simply go away. They are ongoing. They are something they must live with. And so we pray, help them to know that you are there with them, caring for them. May your love sustain them. We pray, O oh Lord, too, that you would give your blessing to the members of our congregation, each and every one. This morning, we, we pray for my family, for Karen and I. We pray for our daughter, Julia. Lord, we pray that a prayer of thanks that we can be part of this church family. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we can have brothers and sisters in the Lord here in this church community. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to work in and through all of us as those who are the body of Christ, that we may be his arms of love, that we may be willing servants, that we may bring his praises as we unite not only our voices, but our hearts together. Lord, in this world of pain and hurt and brokenness, we grieve the loss of lives that has taken place because of the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. We grieve the loss of lives taking place in Ukraine because of an unjust war. We grieve the pain and loss of life of students at Michigan State University. We grieve, Lord, the fact that day in and day out, all throughout our nation, people's lives are cut down. They're killed off. Life is taken from them, and often for no good reason. Lord, have mercy upon us. We pray for a change in the attitudes and practices of people in our country. Ultimately, Lord, we know that a change of life can only come from a change of heart. And so we pray that your spirit may be active and that you would graciously change many hearts, that you would redeem many lives. We pray for wisdom for those who must govern our states, our communities, our nation. Lead them as they lead us. We pray that the laws of our land may be pleasing to you, that they may be in harmony with your purposes for us and for our lives. We pray, O oh Lord, for young and old, for those who are working, for those who are retired, for those who are in excellent health and those who 
are feeling the weakness of advancing years. We pray that you would continue to make us aware of the fact that you are our God and we are your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together in Christ alone. Our scripture lesson comes from Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. We'll begin at verse 21 and read through the end of the chapter. Hear the word of the Lord. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference, for all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice, because in his forbearance he had left sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just, and the one who justifies those who have faith 
in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It's excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. The text is verse 25 and 26. Speaking of Christ, Paul writes, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice. And then going to verse 26, he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. People are angry, not only in Turkey, where the body count is over 400,000, not only in Ukraine, where entire cities are being destroyed building by building, but also in Lansing and throughout our nation. Monday afternoon, a man walked into the camp, onto the campus of Michigan State University with a gun. He entered Berkey Hall and began firing his weapon. He shot eight students, immediately killing three, seriously wounding five others. This man didn't know those students. They had done nothing to antagonize him, nothing to harm him. His uncle told News 8 reporters that he suffered from schizophrenia, a, a severe mental illness, and that he had no business possessing a weapon. I don't know if that information has been verified or not. That's the only source from which I've heard that. But in any case, the tragedy has left parents, students, faculty, and, and many among the general public shocked and grieving again. People are not just feeling sad or traumatized, though. They are angry. Why? They're angry because what took place is not right. There's no justification for brutally gunning down college students whom you've never met and who've never done anything at all to wrong you. This frightful and unjust act makes people angry. Angry at whom? Perhaps at no one in particular. Perhaps at the shooter. Perhaps at anyone and everyone who could have taken steps that would have prevented this. The bottom line, though, is that people are angry because a grave moral injustice has been done to these students in their families in the broader community. Our emotions rise up in protest. What happened was just plain wrong. Similar feelings of moral indignation rise up within us, and rightly so, whenever and wherever we or people we know or simply care about as fellow human beings are horribly mistreated, sadly neglected, or deeply wronged. We come by this type of emotional response from God. It, it's within us because we are made in the image and likeness of God. The Bible tells us that God is aroused to anger by the injustices that are carried out every day here on earth. God is supremely just. His passionate devotion to what is right and fair arouses God's wrath when he sees the wicked things that humans do. Already as small children, we realize the great importance of justice, of acting justly. 
children understand that gifts and treats should be handed out fairly. That's only right. They know punishments shouldn't be given to them unless they have done something to deserve it. And in that case, the punishment ought to fit the offense. That's justice. It means giving a person what he has coming. No more, no less. Children, like us adults, rightly feel angry when they're treated unfairly. Often they'll let you know it too. It is God's deep-seated sense of what is right and wrong, just and unjust, that leads God to be passionately opposed to sin. Sin, by definition, is something that shouldn't be. It's something that's not right. It's not fair. Now, many people uh, think of sin, more or less, in legal terms. Sin is the violation of a moral law. You become guilty when you break the law, whether it's God's law or a parent's household rules or some law that the government has passed. From an Old Testament biblical perspective, though, sin is never just a matter of breaking a law. It is that, but it's never just that. The fact that you broke the law is not what makes your act so sinfully wrong. God's people understood that laws exist primarily to define and govern the relationships between people. A law spells out what others have a moral right to expect from you, what they rightly have coming to them from you, because they are your father and mother, because they are a neighbor who's in a bind and, and requires your immediate assistance, because they are the spouse who's entered into an exclusive, all of life, even life created, creating, committed relationship with you. Laws spell out what you have a right to receive as a customer who's purchasing a pound of sugar from a merchant in a store or in the marketplace. You have a right to a full pound. No more, no less. God's laws spell out what he has a right to receive from you. As the great king who delivered our spiritual ancestors from a world-class tyrant, who brought his people into possession of the land that he had promised to them and who faithfully provided them with rain from heaven so that they and their crops and their livestock could live and not perish from the face of the earth. In the biblical worldview, sin involves more than just the violation of some law. When you sin, you violate somebody. The guilt, the moral debt that you take on as a result of your sinful act or failure to act doesn't arise simply because you broke a law that some governing authority wrote down in ink, or carved in stone. Your moral debt, your guilt arises from the fact that you failed to give that someone, your parent, your spouse, your neighbor, your child, your God, what you owe them. You failed to do right by them. God being who he is, when we sin, we typically are doubly guilty. We violate not only one, but two parties. Each time we wrong another person, cheating someone out of the time, the respect, the money, the goods they have coming to them. At the same time, we wrong God. We disregard the instructions our heavenly king has given for how we are to treat other citizens in his kingdom. We fail to respect his rightful authority over us. We harm someone whom he loves deeply. The Bible says that such injustices arouse the anger of God. 
They should. We've dealt with others in bad faith. We've undercut what God's kingdom is all about. We have carelessly trampled upon that which God highly values. When a person is not given what is due to them, what we owe them, what they rightly have coming to them, this injustice rightly arouses anger. It's not right. It's just plain wrong. What type of response does this elicit from God? This week, uh, I saw the News 8 uh, coverage of the courtroom sentencing of the white supremacists who went on a shooting rampage in Buffalo, New York, uh, in a grocery store uh, some time back. The young man intentionally targeted only black people, killing 10 of them in cold blood. At the sentencing, perhaps you saw the coverage too, one black woman calmly expressed her intense anger to the shooter for the way he had treated black people. And yet she included in her stern but somewhat gentle remarks, I do not hate you. I do not want you dead. I do want you to think every day of your life about what you have done. A second black woman also expressed her intense anger, but she did so in a very, very different way. Manner. She flew into a verbal rage, told him in no uncertain terms, with a few vulgarities thrown in, how much she hated him for his treatment of black people, and she wished she could get her hands on him and tear him apart. She could barely keep herself close to the speaker's podium, but she really didn't need it. Her voice was loud enough. At one point, the man standing beside her rushed at the shooter to physically harm him. He was immediately restrained by several security guards. Now, these two women displayed their intense, justified anger, but in two very different ways. What is God's anger like? What effect do unjust, sinful acts done to others in the wrongs done against God himself, what effect does this have on God? Judging by the attitudes of many people, including some Christian people, we'd have to conclude that they must think that God is only slightly upset, that he's just a little bit peeved when we've had too much to drink, lose our temper, and hurl cruel, ugly words at a spouse or children. They seem to think that he's only slightly angry when when they backstab another person in a conversation, or use his holy name in ugly, hateful outbursts, or decide that they'd prefer to attend a nightclub or movie theater, and to do so far more frequently than they choose to go to God's house to bring him their praise, their gratitude, their prayers, their worship. In fact, I'm afraid the reason that we often manage to sin and not let let it bother us very much is not out of lack of appreciation for Jesus' suffering and his sacrifice. It's because we've adopted the notion that God is a most wonderfully easygoing type of father. He's a pushover. You don't have to worry about him. He'll let you off. He'll let you off easy. At the other extreme is the view presented in the hellfire and brimstone sermons of times past, of a prior era. In these sermons, God was depicted as quick-tempered and and his anger blazed like a forest fire. Nothing got past him. This was a father whose blood pressure hit the ceiling every time one of his children started to eat his meal before a prayer had been offered. You trembled when you were called to account, and you seldom got off easy at all. Hellfire sermons left people feeling scorched on the outside, but still cold on the inside. The God of the Bible is neither of the above. 
He's not the enraged, out-of-control couple in that Buffalo courtroom. He doesn't act like a, a monster, an enraged monster destroying everything in reach. The pagan gods of Israel's neighbors were said to be prone to such irrational outbursts of earth-scorching anger. Is this what the Bible means when it speaks of God's wrath? Not at all. God's response to sin is restrained. It's measured. It's given out in, in line with his justice. The term wrath speaks to the intensity of God's aversion to sin. It describes his deep, holy revulsion and opposition to it. In Romans 1 and 2, Paul informs his readers that the wrath of God is aroused by the godlessness and wickedness that he observes on earth, by the idolatry, the greed, the arrogance, the deceitfulness, the cruelty, bickering, and sexual impurity that's, that's present wherever he looks. He's justly angry at the failure of human beings to give him, their creator, and to give each other what they rightly have coming to them. Oh, don't expect God to blow his top only to cool off later and forget all about it and let us off easy. God's anger is steady and predictable. It's like that of a courtroom judge. It's not rooted in, in passing emotions. It arises from his devotion to seeing that justice is done. We need not live in fear that God's wrath will lead him to blast the planet to smithereens at it any moment, his response is restrained and perfectly just. In fact, Paul describes God's immediate present time punishment, his present judgment or sentence on sin in this way. God has given them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to their shameful lusts, and to a depraved mind. God has given sinners over to their sin. Now, this doesn't mean that God is causing them to keep on sinning. His punishment is to abandon them to their sinful ways. He will not mercifully intervene. He will not put an immediate stop to it. Sin carries its own punishment. God leaves them to live the miserable life they've brought upon themselves. Is that all? Is that all that his wrath amounts to? No. That's not God's full and final sentence. In Romans 2 verse 5, Paul warns of a coming day, the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. In fact, Paul says that when humans sin, they're storing up wrath, more and more wrath, toward themselves. No one should think either that they're exempt from being the deserving objects of God's just and holy response of, of wrath toward human sin. God's covenant people, Paul says, certainly shouldn't think that way. If anything, those who know God and know his will are more blameworthy since God has revealed to them the righteous way to treat each other and their great God. Paul's quick to call out his fellow Jews for their hypocrisy. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? He concludes, there is no one righteous, not even one. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. This is the predicament we are in. This is the predicament that faces the human race. We are all sinners. We have all aroused God's just wrath. We have not done right by God 
We have not given others what they have every right to expect from us. Even if God wished to, he cannot let sinners off with a mild slap on the wrist. That would not be just. He cannot let people simply get away with murder or with slandering their neighbor or with greed or with treating him disrespectfully. He can't pretend he hasn't noticed that people are more passionate in their love of sports and in their praise of sports figures than in their love of God and their praise of him. He notices when people put their own interests ahead of the interests of others. For God to simply let people off, perhaps with a stern warning, that would not be right. It would make him into an unjust judge. When someone sins, someone needs to pay. Justice demands to be satisfied. Our sin has a price tag attached to it. When we do not give others or God what we owe, we run up a moral debt, and that debt grows and grows. If this were not so, Jesus would not have taught us. He would not have taught his own devoted followers to penitently plead before our Heavenly Father, forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts. But how can God grant such a request? As much as he might like to. How can God justly declare to sinful people, I love you, my child. I accept you just as you are. Just as if you had never sinned. That's right. As if you had never, ever sinned. Not even once. How is it that a holy God can justify mercifully acting on his desire to justify sinners and accept them into his kingdom? That isn't right. That isn't just, is it? How can God be both just and the one who justifies sinners? Jesus shouts out. He shouts out to the whole world. His face beaming with warmth and love, his eyes sparkling with delight. Yeah, yes, my, my father can do that. He can do that. He has the right to do that. I'll tell you why. I paid your debt. There on the cross, I atoned for your sin. They've been paid off, paid in full. So yes, it's true. Your Father in heaven now has the right to accept you just as if you had never sinned. Trust me when I tell you that my blood has paid for your pardon. You have been redeemed. It is finished. Believe it. Come. Come to me. Put your faith in me. I am your savior. I am your king. Come, enter into my father's kingdom. Come, eat of the feast that I have prepared for you. Amen. As we prepare to come to the Lord's supper table, we look to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's stand as we sing stanza one of Behold the Lamb.
seated. People of God, lift up your hearts to the Lord. We come before God our Savior with loving, grateful hearts. We praise you, God, for you have created heaven and earth, appointed us rulers and caretakers over it, and called us to journey through life with you, our awesome maker, holy Lord, our shepherd, king. You have kept covenant with us, even though we have sinned against you. Pulled this way and that, living in this world of sin, but acknowledging Jesus as Lord, our souls find rest in you alone. We give you thanks, Christ Jesus, for providing atonement for our sins and delivering us from the tyranny of the devil. From your throne on high, you have sent us the Holy Spirit so that by his power at work within us, we may become new creations. Therefore, we join our voices with those of the saints who've gone before us, your holy angels, and all creation to proclaim the glory of your name. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus Christ instituted this Holy Supper, a gracious, sacramental meal by which to bond us more firmly to him and one another, by which to assure us of our participation in his death and resurrection and provide us with spiritual nourishment so that we may gladly live for him until he comes again. The Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper, and he gave thanks. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Through this sacrament, we proclaim our Christian faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ is coming again. Let us pray. Lord our God, as we partake in faith, bond us more firmly to Christ our Savior. We give you thanks for the rich spiritual blessings that are ours through him. Through this sacrament, strengthen us in our faith, deepen our love, and securely anchor us in the hope of your return. By the power of the Holy Spirit, gather your whole church into your glorious kingdom. We pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, <coughs> thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Congregation of Jesus Christ, the Lord has prepared his table for all who love him and trust in him alone for their salvation. All who are truly sorry for their sins, who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, and who desire to live in obedience to him as Lord, 
are now invited to come with gladness to the table of the Lord. As the bread is distributed, we'll be singing together stanza two of Behold the Lamb. Take and eat, remember and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins.
take and drink. And as you do so, remember and believe that the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Would you please stand and join with me as we express our faith that we have been justified. We are right with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Since we have been justified by faith, we have, excuse me, since we have been justified by grace through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him. We have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.